welcome you. want to thank you for being a part of what God is doing here at Restoration Christian Fellowship. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for joining us on this Sunday morning. It's good to be here. Worship was just, I'm going to call it off the chain. Amen. I tell you what, I'm hoping you're feeling and sensing what we are sensing and feeling um, out in this place because God is definitely moving in place. JB, thank you, man. Thank you for great song selection. That last song spoke to my heart. I want more of you, God. We'll be talking about that in the upcoming weeks. But bless the Lord. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being a part of what God is doing and how God is moving in our midst. We're going to jump right into the Word, but before we go into the Word, I just need to, I just need to make a comment. I just need to say this, and then we're going to read our Scripture, and then we're going to pray and go into the Word. Uh, we know that the announcement has been made from our federal government that churches are deemed as essential places uh, where people can go. But I want to say to you, in my world, the church has always been an essential place of worship. That has never changed in my spectrum. It's never changed in my world. But what I want you to, to know on behalf of Restoration Christian Fellowship, that your safety is of utmost concern to us. We are more concerned with your safety than trying to get people to gather while we're still trying to figure out what's going on with this pandemic. So here's what I want you to hear me say. We want to encourage you to stay home until we tell you otherwise, until our governor and we figure out what's going on within the state of Colorado. Stay home, tune in, watch online. I'll be sending out a video this week to communicate more after I've spoken to our board on what we're going to do. But don't worry about RCF being open tomorrow. Or R RCF has always been hoping, right? But we just want to encourage you, don't be in a hurry to come out and to corporate worship. We're not ready for that yet. We want to make sure that you're safe. I mean, my goal is that you stay safe. Our board's goal is that you stay safe. We don't want people contracting stuff that we're not in control yet. So continue to pray for wisdom. Continue to pray that God would just give us wisdom in how to deal with this, how to handle this, and that God would move and have his way. So today the word I want to share with you is going to talk a little bit about how we survive life storm, right? How do we make it in the midst of this difficulty, in the midst of these challenging times, that God would move and have your way. So keep us in prayer. Uh, for those that are on our distribution list, you'll get some communication from us this week, but we'll talk about that a little bit more. But if you're wanting to know right now, um, we're good. You know, we're just bringing our team out and the essential people to make sure that service goes, and we hope that you are enjoying the service from the comfort of your home. Now, I will say this. Don't get it twisted. I do miss you all. <laughs> we do miss seeing you each other. It's, it's weird coming in here and not be able to shake hands, not be able to hug, not be able to touch each other, and everyone's wearing masks and um, doing all the sanitary stuff. We miss the, the, the human touch, but just let you know that we care. For those that are watching on Facebook, on YouTube, on the RCF Network, uh, let's spread the word. God is doing some awesome things, and we thank God for that. So allow God to move and have his way in our midst. Amen? If you have your Bibles, grab your Bibles and go with me to the book of Mark. Mark chapter 4, uh, verses 35 through 41. I want to read a passage of Scripture that's there. We're going to spend some time just dealing with that and sharing with that so that the good Lord would move and have his way. Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. I am going to read that, then we're going to walk through to enable God to move and have his way. It begins by saying this, On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, sleeping on the cushion. And they woke him and said, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he, awoke and he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear, and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? 
Lord have mercy. Wherever you find yourself, I want you to turn to them, be it at home, be it, be it in your car, be it wherever you find yourself, and turn to your neighbor and say, hey, neighbor, Jesus can help us survive life's storm. Yeah, come on, tell them. Just say, Jesus can help us survive life's storm. Amen. I am still feasting off the energy that was in this room, so we thank God for that. Amen. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, you're wonderful God. Holy Spirit, you are gracious God. Holy Spirit, you are mighty. You are awesome. You are phenomenal. And as we stand to say your word, I am praying for preaching power, God. I want to hear from you. So, Holy Spirit, Felix dies and Felix moves out of the way because I really don't have nothing to say, God. We want to hear from you and you alone. So, God, as we find ourselves in these challenging times, as we find ourselves, God, in unprecedented times, in times where we don't know what tomorrow holds, places where the majority of us in this generation has never been before, continue to prove yourself faithful. And as we release this word, God, I'm praying that it would be an encouraging word to the body, God, just as the worst, the words of every song that were sung today had meaning. So we're praying, God, that the word, too, would have meaning and someone would be encouraged to be who God would have us to be. So as we talk about surviving life song for the next couple of weeks, God, open our hearts to hear, to be in tune. So bring to remembrance, God, the things that have been deposited Teach us to hear from you, God, and to adjust God word. We love you, we worship you, and we adore you. It is in your name we pray and thank you. Amen and amen. Now, I don't know about you, but, but uh, most uh, of us in one point or another in our lives, um, we've had to deal with a storm. I'm just going to say it like that. We've experienced a storm. And the interesting thing that I know about experiencing these life storms is that the storms don't call you ahead of time and say, hey, next week I'm about to mess your life up. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? They, they just come unexpectedly without warning, without any, any introduction at all. You wake up one day and then here's the song. Let, let me give you a few examples. You ever notice that the moment you make up your mind, well, let me put myself in it. The moment we make up our mind that we're going to do better, we're going to be different, we're going to change, we're going to turn things around, we wake up and the very next day, here comes the storm. Yeah. It's interesting that whenever you make a change, right, we say we're going to set goals, we're going to turn things around in our life, you look up and then here comes the storm. For some of us, we've been struggling financially trying to make it. And then we decide we're going to sit down and set a budget. We're going to put things in place. We're going to go to school. We're going to change our MO, modus, of op, our modus operandi. We're going to do things differently. And the moment we say that, guess what happens? Here comes the storm. I tell you, uh, if it, maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's the job. Maybe it's some predicament. Maybe some search situation. And the moment we say we're going to change, here comes the, strong, the storm. For the majority of the world, the place that we find ourselves in today, when this thing first hit the news, here's what most of us thought. Well, it's just restricted to China, right? It's just going to be something that China is going to have to deal with. And the next thing you know, it's in our nation. It's in our country. It's in our state. Then it hits our jobs. Then it hits our neighborhood, and a sad commentary for some of us, it ends up being in our home. The storm, it just shows up, this COVID-19 storm, and we don't know what to do about it. And we panic, and we want to know, how do I survive the storm? How do I make it? Well, my hope this morning with the sermon, with the word that God has dropped in my spirit, that it will enable us to be able to survive the storm and to make it and to be all that God would have us to be. And if you look at this text that's in front of us this morning, this text opens up with Jesus in the book of Mark chapter 4, where he is sitting beside the Sea of Galilee and he's teaching his disciples, and matter of fact, the crowds start to show up so much that he had to retreat to a small fishing boat and be pushed away a little from the sea so he can begin to teach his disciples. And he's teaching the crowd, and he's teaching the people, and he's releasing the Word of God in their lives. He's telling them about parables, and he's telling them about the purpose of parables, and he's telling them about the fact that you don't put a lamp and hide it under a 
bushel. He's telling them about the parables of the seed, and he's, he's telling them the parable of the mustard seed. And then at the end of the day, he decides to retreat. He decides to take a retreat and to go somewhere across the ocean to rest with his disciples. And on their way to the other side, guess what happens? The storm shows up. I tell you, these storms just have a way of just disrupting life. They have a way of just messing us up. So we've got to be able to prepare for the storm. So today there are six simple principles that I want to share with you this morning to help us understand the perspective on how do we make it through the storms, how do we survive these storms, and how do we be who God would have us to be. The first thing I want you to understand with me this morning is that storms have a way of showing up Whenever we face a crossroad in life, I want you all to hear me say that. Number one, that storms have a way of showing up whenever we face a crossroad in life. Look at the text. Look at verse 35. Notice I love the way this opens up because this carries such great symbolism that it helps us make it through the day. It opens up by saying, on that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let's Go across, across over to the other side. This is interesting. It says, on that day, the day when you decided that you've had enough of the world. Come on, am I talking to myself? That, that day when you decide that the world has nothing else to offer, right? That, that day when you said that I make up my mind, I'm going to pass from death to life because I need Jesus the more. That day when you surrender your life to Jesus. That way, day when you're tired of trying what you've been t- doing. Maybe it's, it's drugs. Maybe it's alcohol. Maybe it's women. Maybe it's men. Maybe some circumstance. But you wake up one day and you say, enough is enough. On that day. Then when you make the difference to say, let me go to the other side. And what the other side symbolizes is the fact that I'm going to cross over. The the, the day that I'm not going to do things the way I've been doing it for a long time. I'm going to stop the lying. I'm going to stop the cheating. I'm going to stop all the crazy stuff. That day (laughs) when we make a decision to go to the other side. Watch out for the storm, right? You got to be, because I want you all to hear this say this, because some of us make the mistake of thinking, why me? Why is stuff always happening in my life? And here's the reason it happens, is because you're making a decision on that day to go to the other side, and when we make that decision, the devil is not going to sit still and just let you be all sold out for Jesus. So on that day, I want to hear me say storms have a way of coming at the crossroads of your life, right? And so listen to this. Listen to this, this next slide here. Storms have a way of entering your life such that they present us with a crisis of belief and they press us, hear this out now, to a place of dependence on God. Of, on God. Now, now, I want you all to get this in your spirit because storms don't just come to be coming. There's a purpose and there's a reason, and when they show up, they they meet you and they present you with a crisis of belief. And then the whole premise of the storm is to press you to a place of dependence on God so we can find out who God is. So, So if you find yourself at a crossroad and the storm shows up, here's number one, don't be surprised. That's what storms do. Now, the second thing I want you to hear me say this morning, and listen to number two, right? Jesus on board, hear this, y'all. Jesus on board does not prevent the storm from coming. His presence is only a guarantee that you're going to make it through the storm. Oh, I got to say that again. I got to say it again because you've got a lot of disillusioned Christians that's wondering what's going on. I've got Jesus on board. Why is the storm coming? His presence is not to prevent the storm, but his presence is to guarantee that you're going to make it. Oh, Lord Jesus, yeah, that you're going to make it. Look at the text. Look at the text. Look at the text. Y'all probably wondering where in the world he's getting. Now look at verse 36. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, and I love the phrase that it says, just as he was. Here Jesus was in a boat teaching all day, and then they decides to take him with them in the boat just to the other side. I'm trying to let y'all hear me say there's this gross misconception 
that here's what people say to people, and here's what the church say to people in the world. The world that's struggling, they're trying to make, hey, come to Jesus and it'll all be over. I, let me clarify that for a little while. When you come to Jesus, it just might get worse. Because the devil is going to release all the forces of hell. He's going to release everything after you to get you to come back. So I want to say it again. I'm going to sound like a broken horse. Jesus on board will not prevent the storm. But it is a guarantee. You got to hear me say that. It is a guarantee that you will make it through the storm. When I look at the text, the text is clear. The disciples had Jesus in his physical presence on board that boat with them. If you think there would be any group of individuals that were more safe, it would have been those 12 guys with Jesus on the board. But here's what happened. The storm, the storm still comes. I wish I had a church full of folk because I'd have you to say to each other, all of us in here with Jesus on board, isn't it true that we've encountered some storm? Come on. But the reason you're still here is, is, is because with him on board, the storm couldn't take you out. Oh, Lord Jesus. Yeah, 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 yeah. The storm couldn't take you out because he was on board. So listen to this. Listen to this. Salvation then, right, is not a guarantee from the trials of this life on earth, it is a guarantee of eternity with Christ. Lord Jesus, yeah. I know, I know the church folk don't like that one because we want to say Jesus will work it out. Sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes he does. But his focus is not life on earth. It's eternity in heaven with Christ. So secondly, hear me say this, Jesus on board does not guarantee or prevent the storm. It's a guarantee we will make it through. Now, now here, this, is, this third point, I want you all to see this in the text, is very, very important. Look at number three. Here's what number three says, right? The focus of, of the storm, though it may impact others, it's always about you. Now, I know you all don't like that, okay? That, that's number three. The focus of the storm, right? Though it may impact others, it's always about you. Look at what the text says here in the next verse. It says here, and look at verse 36 uh, again. Leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat just as he was. And I love the text. And there were other boats with them. And they were other board boats with them. Look at that in the Bible. And there were other boats with them. Why am I driving that point home? It's because when the storm hit, and as you read this in verse 36, when the storm hits, there is no mention of the other boats that were with them. The only focus is the boat that Jesus was in and the 12 disciples. I, I need to drive that point home because here's what's happening, right? Is, is when I find myself going through something, I always want to find someone to blame. I want to find somebody to point finger to. I want to point somebody external to me, and I want to say to them, it's because of you that I'm in this mess. It's because of you that I find myself in this situation. Or better say that here's what I want to do. I want to release a prophetic word over their life to tell them what they need to do to make it through the storm. And I'm going through the storm myself. Oh, my goodness, we got to get this. Though there may be other boats with you, the focus number three is not the external, it is the internal. So, so hear me say this. When you find, when we find ourselves going through, stop looking externally to others and to other situations and circumstances and raise your hand and say this, God, what should I learn about you while I am going through the storm? Come on, are you hearing me? Ask yourself, God, what should I learn from you while I am going through the storm? Because the text is clear. There were other boats with them. But when the storm hits, you don't hear Mark saying, well, boat number three was struggling. A boat number four, the wave had them a certain way. A boat number five, that one sunk. No, 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 no. The focus was the boat that was in perspective, and that's the one with Jesus and the disciples on board. So hear me say this. If Jesus is on board and Jesus is in your life, the focus will always be you when we're going through the storm. I wish I had somebody in here that would get a hold of this. So, so, so here's the thing I want you all to get this. Listen, storms then 
are designed for individual transformation, not necessarily group learning. <laughs> Lord Jesus. Yeah, when I'm going through the struggle with my job, it's not for my company to learn a lesson. <laughs> are you hearing me? When I'm going through a struggle in my marriage, it's not for my entire family to learn a lesson. I wish I had somebody in here. When I'm going through the storm of financial difficulty, it's not for my bank to learn a lesson. Individual transformation. Are you hearing me? Not group learning. So quit looking at the other person and start opening up your heart and looking on the inside and start saying, God, what do I need to learn about the storm? Here's the fourth thing. Here's the fourth thing. And I know I'm moving rapidly, but I want you all to get this. Storms are designed, listen to this, to teach us to rest in God during the times of difficulty. i got to say it again, and I'm going to fresh this out. Storms, then, are designed to teach us to rest in God during the times of difficulty. So let's look at this text. Let's read this from verse 37 to 38, then I'll talk about this. Look, and a great storm, it says, a windstorm, arose and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. Verse 38 says, but he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. My goodness, this is troubling. A great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling, and he was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. Here's what you need to know historically, culturally, about that, that Sea of Galilee and Palestine within that time frame. This sea was located, and it was surrounded by mountains on either side, and it was like the mountains formed what would seem like a basin around the Sea of Galilee. And the only opening was the ridges on the southwestern slope of the mountain. And what would happen is that winds would out of nowhere just come, and the only entrance point was through that southwestern opening, and they would come into that lake with fierceness and with suddenness. And what would seem to be a calm in one moment, the force of those violent winds would all of a sudden and turn the, the calm into a ferocious storm and start thing, turning things upside down. So where one moment you might be smooth sailing, the next moment all of a sudden everything is turned upside down and you're wondering where in the world did that come from. So, so this is the situation where Jesus found himself in. This is the situation where the disciples found themselves in. They left the shore on a good note and they were smooth sailing. Then all of a sudden disruption came. No different than what happened to this world with the coronavirus, right? One moment we're smooth sailing and then all of a sudden out of nowhere disruption came and we're wondering what what in the world is going on? What's happening here? What's happening in this present moment? And here's what I want you to know about storms, right? Is that storms have a way of coming suddenly. I said this during my introduction. They don't warn you. They don't want to say, here I come. They just show up. One moment peace and then all of a sudden chaos, right? One moment all is well and then all of a sudden disaster. One moment you have a job and then you wake up the next day, I have no job. That's the suddenness of the storm. But not only does it come suddenly, the storm carries grace, great wind with it. The wind comes, and then the wind is so ferocious, it starts to disrupt our lives, and it starts to cause all kinds of craziness in your life. Matter of fact, it's so strong, the wind is so strong, that sometimes it causes us to question our salvation. Come on, talk to me. Sometimes that wind is so strong, it causes, it causes some of us to stop coming to church because we don't have to deal with the church folk because of the wind of the storm. I wish I had somebody in here. Sometimes that wind is so strong that you don't want to deal with Christians anymore. I know I'm not talking to myself because some of us have been through church storms. And they're painful and the noise of the wind. Come on, y'all. Sometimes it's so strong, you want to walk away from your marriage. Come on, talk to me. Sometimes it is so strong, it causes you to file for divorce. Sometimes it is so strong, the force of the wind. 
And that's what storms does. But here's what the fourth point says. You don't let the sound of the wind and the noise of the storm disrupt you. We've got to learn how to sleep. <laughs> yeah, you've got to learn. You've got to learn how to rest. Notice the text, right? The text talks about that southwestern wind coming and disrupting the water in the basin. And the disciples are panicking for their life. But where's Jesus? He is asleep on a cushion in the boat. Now, if you were to ask me why was Jesus able to sleep in such a storm, here's what I'm going to say to you. Jesus knew who the master of the storm was. And I think he wanted his disciples to learn who the master of the storm is. And I'm hoping that by the end of this message, you too will learn who the master of the storm is. And my problem is, and your problem is, when the storm comes, we say we know the master, but yet and still we don't go to sleep. Uh, by virtue of the fact that you and I stay awake during the storm is indicative of the truth that we don't know the master the way we think we do. I wish I had somebody. So here's what it looks like. It's a said faith versus a realized faith because if we really knew God, corona or not, we'd be asleep. <laughs> In the middle, come on, talk to me, y'all. In the middle of a storm. So a lot of us, a lot of us are struggling with that. But now notice the fifth thing, and I'm almost done, I'm almost done. Notice the fifth thing. I want y'all to hear me say this. When we find ourselves in a storm, please hear me say this, church. Jesus is the only one qualified to calm the storm in our lives, not us. I got to say that again, and I've got to say this carefully, that Jesus is the only one qualified to calm the storm, not us. I, I don't know who you're sitting next to, but I need you to turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, Jesus is the only one qualified to calm the storm in your life, not you. Now, watch the text, right? Watch the text, and I've got one more thing to share with you. Notice what it says, verse 39. And they awoke him, and he, he awoke, and well, let me back on it. Teacher, don't you care? I'm in the middle of verse 38. Don't you care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind, and he said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was great calm. Now, let me, let me flesh this out for a moment. So y'all bear with me and give me a little bit of time to work on this, okay? So, so please note that I want you to hear me say that what I'm trying to communicate this morning, your job is to sleep during the storm, not to speak to the storm, okay? Because I want you to hear me say this. You don't have that ability. I don't have that ability. Only God does. I, I got to say that one more time. Because here's the thing. If the disciples had the ability to speak to the storm, why wake Jesus up? You kind of get what I'm saying, right? And, and let me just, let me tag on to that. The problem with a lot of us, because we've got a bad hermeneutic of what Romans 4 and 17 says. Here's what Romans 4 and 17 says, right? And he called those things into existence that, that were not into existence. Here's what King James says. Call those things to be that are not. And a lot of us have fooled ourselves into thinking we read that scripture and we misinterpret it and we think that we can speak to the storm. I, I, I hate to bring you news this morning. You're not not God. We need God to speak through us to the storm. We don't have the ability to do it ourselves. We need to wake Jesus up. Problem with a lot of us, we going around speaking to things and you want to know why it ain't changing? Because you don't have that ability. You want to know why things aren't happening? Because we don't have that ability in and of ourselves and by ourselves. I want y'all to hear me say this. I'm going to spend a lot of time on this Wednesday. So come on, come back on Wednesday. We're going to talk through this. We don't have that ability. If I want the storm in my life to cease, I need to call on Jesus. And if Jesus wants to work through me to speak to the storm, that's his business, not mine. The disciples had sense enough to wake him up. And when he awoke, he showed them what he could do. I can't help but reflect on Abraham and Sarah. Abraham, 
Abraham, God released the word. And because God was taking his time, God said, listen, I'm going to give you a child at this time next year. And God was slow in doing what God was going to do. And here's what Abraham decided. He decided he was going to call those things that be not as though they were. And he went and got him an agar and spoke life into it. Notice what came out, an Ishmael. And a lot of us are giving birth to Ishmael, not an Isaac, because we think we can speak things into existence. Hear me carefully. Jesus is the only one qualified to calm the storm in life, not us. Let me say this last thing, then I'm going to take my seat, right? Look at the last thing. This is very, very important because I want you all to press this with me and not get ahead of me. So here's the thing. When, when, when facing the storms of life, and we're going to pick this up next week, stop engaging Jesus based on fear, but engage him based on faith. Okay, now you're like, where in the world is this man coming from? Where is he getting this? Look with me at the verse. Look with me at verse. Look with me at verse. What verse is that? Verse is um, 40 and 41. And he said to them, why are you so what? Afraid. And look at the next phrase. Have you still no faith? And they were filled with what? Fear. They weren't filled with the Spirit. They were filled with fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the sea obey him? Back up in the verse 38 to give you a little boat. They were looking for Jesus. He was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. Watch this. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care that we are perishing? The problem with this text is that most of us have not done our exegetical work on the text and we read it to our own lens of spirituality. But let me, let me break the news to you on what's really happening in the text. You've got to see this. Jesus had just selected his disciples. They didn't know him like you and I know him today. Come on, I want you all to get this. They might have seen him perform a miracle or two. They might have seen him do a miraculous thing or two. They listened to him teach. They watched him heal the sick. They, they, but they'd never seen him done this. So they get in this boat, and they're crossing over to the other side, and that southwestern wind comes in, and all of a sudden, the boat is reeling and it's rocking. It's going from one side to the other, and what the text says is that that the boat starts to fill with water. So notice what's going on. You've got to see every disciple in that boat scrambling for their lives. Some are trying to pull the sails down. Some are trying to stable the oars. And some are dipping water out of the boat. And I can see Peter dipping water. I can see James throwing water out. I can see Andrew. And some are screaming, ah! And some are panicking. And we're going to die. We're going to die. And then somebody says, where's Jesus? How come he isn't helping us? How come he doesn't have a bucket in his hand? How come he's not taking water out of the board? And somebody says, where he's Jesus? And the people in the back of the boat said, he's right here asleep. And then those in front say, he's what? Sleep. Here we are freaking out, and Jesus is back there asleep. So look at the text. They go back there, and they say, hey, man, get up. Don't you care that we're dying? It wasn't like, dear Lord, help us in this moment. No. They were freaking out. And they yelled at him, don't you care that we're dying? You better get you a bucket before we throw you overboard. You've got to get the text. And then Jesus gets up. Look at the wind. Yo, man, chill. And the wind stops. And then watch the disciples. Can you believe who in the world is that? Now, the reason I need to stress that point, because when I invoke Jesus, it's not like I know what he can do. I invoke him out of fear, just like the disciples. I want you all to hear me. All of a sudden, the doctor says, you've got cancer. I'm not spiritual. I'm freaking out. Jesus, where you at? How can you sleep in this moment? Help me. All of a sudden, my marriage is on here. Why? Jesus, where you at? Help me. And the majority of our prayer life is just like the disciples on the boat. 
and we engage Jesus out of fear, not faith. And the only reason we testify is because we are shocked at what he I wish I had somebody in here. It's not like you expected him to do it. You're shocked when he did it because you were afraid. You were afraid. Then he gets up and he's like, yo, man, chill, cancer. And you're like, whoa. Uh, praise the Lord, saints, saved, sanctified through the Holy Ghost. Guess what Jesus did? I didn't expect him to do that. He did more than I thought. And his goal is that when we wake him, we wake him based on faith, not fear. And the majority of Christendom is panicking over this Korean corona because we really don't know God can fix it. We're hoping he does. And a lot of us are fearful, not faithful. Church, listen to me and I'm done. If you're going to survive the storm, get to the place where we wake Jesus up out of faith and not fear. Don't be like these disciples. Walked with him. Talked with him. Ate the food he multiplied. Enjoyed the catfish and the hot water cornbread. But when they found themselves in a storm, here they are. Yelling at a sleeping Jesus. And the sad commentary is, the majority of our prayer lives today is just like that. We only yell at him when the storm comes. You get it? Church is yelling right now. We're praying more. Help us, Jesus. Help us, help us. Before, as opposed to laying down next to him, hey, man, you going to do you? I'm sleeping just like you. And rested because he's the God of the wind. He's the God of the wave. He's the God of the storm. He's the God of anything we find ourselves in. My prayer to you this morning is we grow to the place. If we're going to survive life's storm, we know the God that can do it. The God that can perform the miraculous. And the God that can speak to the wind and the waves of our lives and say, peace, be still. Wherever you find yourself this morning, know that God is able. Know that God can heal. Know that God can provide. My prayer is if you don't know God this morning, and you're in the middle of a storm, and you're panicking, you're freaking out, Jesus, grab a bucket, help me get the water out the boat. Jesus, help. He's there to help. He can save you. But you got to wake him up. 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 So I want to challenge you this morning. Wake Jesus up. Be it fear or faith. It doesn't matter at this stage. Just wake him up. Just wake him up. And grow to faith. So listen, if you want to give your heart to God, we have people in those chat rooms. You have people on Facebook Live. People on the network. People on RCF Network. People on YouTube. Wake Jesus up. Reach out to one of them. They're there to pray with you. And if you want to give Christ your life to Christ, I want to pray with you a simple prayer this morning. Just bow your heads. And just repeat that. And be said, Jesus, dear Jesus, forgive me for being a sinner. Forgive me for missing you. Come into my life and save me, Jesus. Rescue me from the storms of sin. Rescue me from the storms of life. Rescue me from where I find myself. Come into my life and save me. And I thank you for saving me in Jesus' name. Let me pray. Holy Spirit, I thank you for your word. That as your word has been released over this atmospheric waves, God, be it a Christian, be it a believer, be it an unsaved person who may not know you, speak peace to their storm, God. Quiet the storms of life. Bring them back to a place where we all realize you're in control. Forgive us for not knowing you like that, God. Forgive us for not knowing you like that. Thank you for being God and thank you for what you can do. You're an awesome, wonderful, and gracious God. Oh, how we love you. It is in your name we pray and thank you. Amen. Amen. Let me say to you this morning, if you prayed that prayer, know that Christ has entered into your life. And I'm going to say to you, find, find 
a great church where you can connect to. It doesn't have to be this one, but just find one. You've got choices. Find a good Bible-believing church and get your heart connected so you can make it through that storm. And for those that's been watching on a weekly basis and participating with us, I want to remind you one again to take financial resources to keep the ministry going. I want to thank all of you that's been given faithfully during this pandemic that God would continue to bless you. I think I'm confident in saying that you have been blessing Restoration Christian Fellowship with your gifts. Keep doing the work. We just want to keep coming to you and proclaiming the gospel. We're able to serve a lot of people because of your gifts. Thank you for those gifts. But if you want to give, you can text Give RCF to 73256. Any gifts of any amount makes a difference. If you're a tither, continue to tithe. You can go to our website and click the red button and give. Uh, the button and give, you can call in. You can go to our um, RCF Ministries at Oregon and just give. We just want to let you know your financial support takes us a long way. And we need you to continue to support us. So thank you for watching today. I want to encourage you to join us on Wednesday at 7 o'clock. We are going to flesh out this text some more because I know some of you have questions. Email me, email the church office. We'll get those. We'll dialogue around those. We'll discuss those. We want to talk about how to survive the storm so that God can move and have his way. Bless you. Thank you so much for tuning in this morning. Thank you so much for joining us. I want to encourage you even after I sign off, stay around. We've got some announcements we want to share with you. And then at 10, 15, we have a beautiful children's program that we're going to do for your kids. So grab your kids around the television to watch that. If you heard the word at 9, email some friends. Start a watch party at 11. Let people see the word in the worship. We'll be there again to do that. And then we'll be back at 5 this afternoon to do it again. So spread the word. Tell people that you can help them survive the storm if they can tune in with us. God bless you. We love you. Appreciate you watching with us. I'll see you all again either at 11 or 5 or Wednesday night at 7. God bless you all. Amen.